webinar. So go ahead. Okay, thanks, Brenda. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody for the webinar for May the 23rd. I guess uh, we'll start off today. We, uh, we're going to talk a bit about uh, what to do with some of those uh, saline areas. We seem to have uh, quite a few saline areas showing up this year in producers' fields, uh, a little bit more than normal, and high, mostly due to the uh, high moisture levels we've had over the last couple of years. So I've been getting quite a few calls lately on it, so I decided that maybe we would uh, talk a little bit about saline areas, how they happen, how we can look at reclaiming some of them, and I guess what the long-term process will be to get some of those areas back again. Then we're also going to end it off with the, the crops update. Uh, we'll start off with the saline uh, the saline uh, areas at the beginning. Uh, Jane Thornton, our forage specialist, has uh, prepared a few uh, slides that uh, I'll go through uh, regarding what we can do on the forage end of it, and uh, we'll just get right into the, the saline issue. So soil salinity, we, like I mentioned, we haven't talked much about it over the last few years, but salinity has become a greater issue in areas that have received excess rainfall over the last few years, and uh, we're seeing it in areas where uh, water laid for long periods of time. We're seeing it in areas where water uh, has never been before, and kind of when you look at look at it, it's basically just uh, in the areas where water accumulator, accumulated and now is leaving them basically when it's leaving, it's leaving the salt behind. So when we talk about managing soil salinity, we're referring to the soluble salts that dissolve in and move with the water. So basically the salts that move through the soil with the water. We're all seeing it, uh, these white spots showing up in the field and they're uh, large areas or there could be small areas or areas around sloughs, areas along roadways are definitely very prominent this year, uh, areas along uh, um, fence lines, anywhere where water can be stopped or, or the natural flow of water has been altered, uh, we can get and have been seeing uh, saline issues showing up. So salinity becomes a problem when there's a high water table and the salts are moved up to the soil surface. As the water with the salts evaporates, a whitish crust is left on the soil surface. This grayish white residue is made up of mostly sodium, calcium, and magnesium phosphates. Sulfate, sorry. While they are harmless deep in the ground, when they concentrate near or on the soil surface, they prevent plant roots from taking in necessary water and nutrients. And basically, we see those areas producing when they get high levels, they produce little to no, uh, no crop at all. The severity of the effects and strategies to address the problems depend on the soil test, on the, on, upon soil testing to identify the amount and the types of salts present. So when we're going to look at these areas and we're going to say, well, what should we be doing? Uh, the option of just going in and cultivating or, you know, to try to bury the salts or cover up that salt with some black dirt and, you know, that's really not solving the problem because basically all you're doing is mixing it with that top four or five inches of soil and it's still there. So the first thing that uh, we'd recommend is to get a soil sample done and the soil sample to do it effectively would be to soil sample both areas of the field. So sample an area that's not affected and then sample the area that's affected. And I guess the biggest thing that we need to know is the EC or the electrical conductivity of the soil because this will help us in determining the amount of salt that is actually in the soil. And once we know that, we can determine our, I guess, set a course as to how we want to treat the area because different areas are going to require different um, different remedies to, uh, to uh, get the land back into production. Now it's going to vary from uh, very little to get it back to several years of work to get it back. When you look at this, uh, this chart here, uh, as you look at the salt content increases, so does your 
uh, electrical conductivity of the soil. So when you're looking on the left-hand side of the chart here, when you go from 0 to 2 to greater than 16, you go from non-saline soil to very severely saline soil. And as you go across, you can definitely see as how it affects crop growth and how it's going to affect your remedy as to determining what you can do to reclaim this land. Then we go lay across even to plant res response. And you can see that some of the areas when you get the, the you know, salts of anywhere from 2 to, to 8, uh, we're still looking at most of the crops we're growing right now. But once you get higher than 8 and into that 16 range, our remedy or our method of, of uh, reclaiming is definitely going to be changing. So managing salinity means learning how to live with it. You can move the salts around by managing the soil water, but you really can't make them go away. So the key is to try, try to manage the soil water by establishing crops or, or moving the water. Now, one of the things with some of these soils is uh, it could be a water issue. And if the problem may be solvable by just managing the water, and in some cases it may, may be uh, making a drain, and uh, if the if the drain is available to be made, then that could definitely help the problem. And we can see a lot of those issues showing up along um, road sites uh, where uh, the natural flow of water has been changed, and because of that, we have water accumulating in areas that it normally wouldn't. Because of this, you get the same the, the salinity building up in those areas. If you can uh, manage the water and get the water moving away, then you you'll avoid uh, you'll avoid the uh, I guess the buildup of the salts in those areas. So, um, moving water is definitely one uh, way of uh, reclaiming some of them. Uh, I think uh, the other one is just managing the soil so that we actually get crops growing on the soil to uh, to to use that water. So I meant. Mentioned a little bit at the start that uh, soil salinity, uh, the, your your management issues or your management for reclaiming is going to is going to vary depending on the severity of the the salt in the soil. But a lot of times, uh, just continuous cropping will uh, will help bring some of that land back. And we did go through two three years of fairly wet conditions, and uh, you know getting a crop going back on those uh, those areas getting the roots into the, uh, the water table, getting the roots using up moisture, uh, getting uh, growing crops that are high, high moisture crops or, or crops that use a, a lot of water, uh, sunflowers, any of those type of crops that get uh, corn, you know, anything with a deep root system uh, will definitely help in, uh, in using a fair bit of water and therefore bringing the water table back to where it normally would be. A lot of the ones we're seeing this year are areas that we haven't seen in a long time, and uh, and that's why those ones could probably be controlled just by getting them back into annual crop. As the severity of the salinity problem increases, though, uh, producers may need to go to say some of the more salt tolerant annual crops, and we'll look again at the chart right away just as to some what some of those are. And uh, you know, uh, you know, for an example, say growing barley instead of growing flax, or growing uh, barley instead of growing uh, canola. Those, uh, those, some of those annual crops can definitely, uh, definitely handle more salt issues, and uh, and can definitely uh, 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 get get the, the land back to where it was. And then. You know, when we get into some of the more severe areas, we're probably looking at uh, perennial forages or, or mixes of perennial forages uh, and some of the salt and flood tolerant uh, uh, forages to get on those areas. Now, these are going to be our severe areas. These are going to be areas that have been uh, perennial problems. They've been uh, problems where we're dealing with them on a yearly basis. So these would be ones that uh, didn't just pop up this year. They're ones that have been around for a while. So those are the ones that uh, you know we should be looking at long-term control measures. When you're looking at uh, you know uh, some of these areas, and if they're really showing up uh, in, on some of your fields this year, uh, there are a few other management things when you're looking at your annual crop to uh, to to go in and uh, 
and get crop established. And one of the things uh, we need to remember is when you're growing a, a crop in an area that has uh, um, has some salinity problems, the salts are definitely going to <coughs> excuse me affect the ability of the uh, seed and germination. Uh, it's going to affect uh, the plant's ability to to just grow as after it germinates and get established. So one thing you might look at doing is um, is a uh, sowing a heavier rate. Uh, some people would almost say double the seeding rate. So if you normally be sowing barley at a bushel and a half to two bushels an acre, some people are saying double seed those areas. Uh, by doing this, uh, you are um, you know just giving the the chance for more of those plants to uh, uh, to get going and survive. The other thing is uh, don't over fertilize those areas because if you're going to double seed them definitely don't be double fertilizing those areas because uh, all you're doing is putting more more of a, a salt issue back in some of those areas especially if you don't get uh, crop established and nothing is using that fertilizer uh, you tend to just get a buildup of fertilizer in those areas and uh, therefore an increase in the salt in those areas. One other thing is those areas uh, tend to be wet uh, and cooler soil. So if you're sowing, um, let's say, barley and into some of those those areas, a uh, a seed treatment probably wouldn't be a bad idea just because it's going to be uh, taking longer for that plant to germinate, uh, longer for that plant to establish, and uh, therefore just giving it more of the ability or more of a fighting chance to get going. I mentioned that we were going to go back to that, the effects of salinity on crop growth chart. And I just want us to look more on the right-hand side at this time. And um, when you look at the, uh, the, uh, the, t the first few crops, you can see that they're more sensitive or the most sensitive to salinity. And, you know, when you look at you got sunflowers and corn in there. So I mentioned that they were uh, crops that can uh, use a fair bit of moisture uh, they're also more sensitive to salinity issues. You know, uh, again, uh, these these uh, these ones here are uh, not high acre crops in the area. I'm thinking we're more in uh, most of the producers are definitely growing these these crops in here, and they can handle some of the salt issues. Uh, canola flax, you know, those uh, barley, you know, and I always think barley is probably one of our best ones for um, for looking at for uh, some of those areas. Once we get past that uh, eight uh, in the electrical conductivity, when we're down into that, you know, eight to 16 range, we're definitely looking at changing our method of uh, reclaiming these areas and with that, we're probably going to have to go to a uh, wheatgrass or uh, wild ryegrass, and we'll get into more of the forages as we get into Jane's portion of the of the presentation. But there are areas that we should be looking at forages, and uh, again, uh, starts with the soil sample to to determine where you are and how bad you are, and then we can go from there. So with that, uh, I'm going to go into uh, uh, Jane's presentation regarding battling saline soils. And uh, Jane Thornton is our forage and pasture specialist, and she uh, works the uh, most of the southwestern side of the province and part of the central side of the province. So as you uh, Seen from some of the previous pictures, uh, areas can become so saline that most plant species have trouble growing and trying to deal with these areas before they become this bad is probably our goal. Uh, however, this year, because of the water situation from last year, it was hard to work on those areas. But uh, one of the comments Jane makes is that barley is having a hard time growing. It's time to uh, receive these areas to forages. So if, uh, if you're having problems getting barley established in any of these areas, then that's probably a key to start looking at, uh, at some, of the, uh, some of the forages uh, to get uh, or reclaim some of this land. 
when you look at salinity, and uh, I didn't get into this at the start because I knew Jane had this in her presentation, but basically just uh, if we follow this, uh, this chart, it kind of goes through groundwater flow and, and soil salinity. So as water infiltrates the soil in an area called the recharge zone, so this is your recharge zone here, so as water enters the soil, and as it travels through the soil, it picks up salts and, uh, and it goes into the water table. So as this water is moving underground, the water comes within, when water comes within about a meter of uh, the soil surface, um, it, uh, it will come to the surface through capillary action. And when that ha happens, the water evaporates and leaves salts behind. So when you normally see saline areas, uh, you normally see your slough area and then the area from the slough outwards is the area where we normally get the majority of our salts building up or our saline areas building up. Now as that area becomes worse and worse, it just keeps extending its way through and then you just get larger and larger areas. Now what our goal is to try to control this area right in here. So if you're looking at a forage uh, for a placement for reducing um, for reducing the stand or reducing your problems, what you should be looking first of all is breaking these areas down, and you know you'll know the areas where the high levels of salts. You should be probably looking at planting some of your more salt tolerant uh, forages, and areas around the salt area should be planted with uh, more of a deep rooted forage to intercept this water that's working its way this way. So salt tolerant forages here because we have the problem already and we need to get something established in those areas because it's a salt tolerant problem already and most of the you know most of the crops we've been trying to grow in that area aren't growing but if we can get some control in this area here with some deep rooted forages so some of the alfalfas anything with a tap root to get down into the soil area and to use up moisture so when it gets to this point here, it doesn't get, get, get as close to the soil surface. What you'll do is you'll bring this, this area back this way. And that's kind of our goal. Now, to say we're going to get 100% control is probably fooling ourselves, but I guess the goal is to bring, is to bring it backwards and bring this towards uh, the slough or back, back into workable area. So some of the problems in establishing the forages, plants are most sensitive to salinity during germination. And I mentioned that a little bit about the increase in the seeding rate on barley. And plants affected by low water availability, plants unable to take up water because of osmotic pressure differences. When you uh, have high saline soils, uh, a lot of times the, uh, the plants are not, a, you know, water is not available to the plants because it's being bound to the salts. So those plants have basically have low water availability and aren't able to germinate. So they're sitting there uh, basically in, in, in soil that, and then, then the worst case scenario is they have toxic effects on the salt that are affecting the, uh, the germination. So you get adverse physical and nutrient conditions when the plant is trying to germinate. So when um, that plant is, when those seeds are planted, if it does isn't able to access moisture to germinate, uh, it starts to uh, deteriorate that way. If it does get nutrients or moisture to germinate, then you also get the fact that it's going to be struggling for nutrients because of the fact that it's just not uh, not available to, uh, I guess, get established well enough to access some of those nutrients. The next issue we have in a lot of these areas is um, some of the weeds like uh, like kosher uh, or foxtail barley uh, tend to be uh, very thick and highly highly competitive in these areas, and that seems to be uh, one of the one of the, the tricky things of getting a forage established because there's really no control measures when you're trying to get the, your forage going. Anything you're going to spray to get kosher or foxtail barley is also going to affect your seedlings uh, that you're that you're uh, uh, or your your forages that you're trying to establish. 
So with that, you really need to look at uh, some type of uh, control measure early on. Uh, Burn-offs are very important, uh, probably more than just the spring burn-off, but also uh, burn-off uh, be just before your forages come through or your seedings get established. One of the other problems with kochia is it's such a flushing weed that uh, it'll it'll get going or keep going throughout the growing season. So yeah, we try to take care of the weeds prior to seeding. The other thing uh, with forages and this sometimes becomes a bit of a problem, um, but uh, because of the cost, depending on what uh, what forage you're planting, is uh, again doubling uh, up the seeding rate on the forages to uh, get them established. I guess the good thing about it is we're usually not talking large acres. Uh, you know, we're talking you know, depending I guess on the area, but I guess you know, most cases when you go out and take take a look at them, a lot of these. Uh, areas are 10 acres or 15 acres and so doubling up sounds expensive per acre but your acres you're treating is is smaller. Make sure that the seed you're planting has good germination because that's uh, uh, you know important to get it going if you've got poor germination or poor vigor seed uh, basically you're wasting your time because it's going to need all the help it can get going to get going through the poor growing conditions. So this is uh, a chart showing the relative tolerances for crops and uh, and weeds to salt, and uh, we talked a bit about it when we looked at the the chart earlier on. But it basically just had most of the uh, the crops, and they're down in the corner here. But uh, one of the things I wanted to show with this one is, or Jane wanted to show with this one was uh, which forages uh, have more uh, tolerance to some of the some of the salts and when you look at you know some very high tolerances to salts we're looking at some of the slender wheat grasses uh, the tall wheat grasses and these are fairly common uh, in the in the southwest here um, you know they have some different growing uh, growing patterns and some different long, longevities in the soil and that should uh, help us uh, we should look at those when we're, when we're making our decisions but you know, we do have some options as to uh, what we can use in some of these areas uh, to get uh, get control of some of these saline areas. And then, as we get away from our uh, our high risk area and we get into the moderate areas, we definitely can look at some of these, like the alfalfa, to get into some of those uh, tap root areas and. Uh, you know, you also notice that uh, you know barley in those areas would still be growing. So um, again, just something that uh, you know, once we get past the high area, we get into an area where it's a different treatment and a different product or a different variety need to be planted. This uh, this slide uh, is is regarding uh, you know, I guess when you look at the variability of a lot of these areas. And when you go out there and do your soil sample, you're going to find that it's going to be, you know, probably higher salts as you're closer to the water, and as you move away, you're going to get lower salts. And you know, how many blends do we want to get, or how many, you know, uh, how are we going to look at doing this? Because you know, some things just aren't aren't uh, economical to be uh, doing them in little strips. So, and it's going to depend on our seeding equipment. So sometimes uh, it doesn't hurt to look at a, a mixture. Uh, there are some mixtures through some of the different companies that uh, are suited for saline areas. And I guess with this, I just want to, uh, if you've got an area that's very high in salinity, when you're looking at mixtures, you should be looking at some of the wheat grasses uh, in your mix, and just because they do a lot better in saline areas. So, you know, uh, if you're looking at a mix and you've got a, an area out there that won't grow barley right now, that's probably something you should be looking at when you go to look at your mix. If you've got an area out there that's uh, growing barley but it's growing it poorly and you just know that you, you're losing land every year, you know, this type of mixture here might be your option. And, and truthfully, once it's established, it's probably going to produce a lot better than mixture one. But 
we're using them for two different things. This is for the area where we're trying to control the amount of water going to the, the discharge area, and this area here is your salt uh, discharge area or the area that's creating the biggest problem for you right now. And when you start getting it established, you're definitely not going to see it all green up at the same time, and that's mainly because you've got different concentrations in different areas. So what do you do when you've got a situation like this? You sow it down to alfalfa, and then you've got areas in here that are still going to Fox del Barley and uh, Kosha, and uh, you only got a bit of alfalfa in spots throughout here and here, and, you know, um, I guess the one good part about this is it definitely helps you to identify your critical areas or your areas that you know that the one mixture you used uh, never got established in there. Now, if you want to reclaim the whole thing, uh, what you could do is go back in these areas and try to establish uh, you know, a mixture one in there with the slender wheat grasses. Uh, that, would, uh, that would definitely help out. Uh, the other thing would be to uh, uh, look at controlling some of the weed issues and uh, because uh, Fitzcosia is an issue and it being a flushing weed is going to solve your problem. I think what you need, even if you've got kosher growing on there or foxtail barley growing on there, they're still using water and they're helping to get uh, water out of the, the soil and, and bringing that water level down. So even though they're weeds uh, and they can be bad weeds, uh, you know, we still have something growing there. But mowing might be a better issue than, than going in and trying to work it and keep it black because keeping it black is only creating more of a problem. It's actually not helping the problem. So uh, as long as something's growing on there, um, I would say mowing is, is a better option than, uh, than, uh, than uh, tilling. So what can you expect? Well, you're definitely going to have patchiness. You're going to have weeds. You're going to have lower yield. And, uh, you know, depending on what you plant, you're going to have uh, decreased uh, uh, longevity of your stand. And if you just quickly go back to the chart here, uh, when you look at uh, establishment-wise and then you know, you know that if they're slow establishing and uh, you've got poor establishment, you're probably only going to have, your longevity is probably not going to be, be great. So just to look at a few of them, uh, Rush, Russian wild rye it was one of the ones for your saline, our, our high saline areas, uh, slow to establish, uh, fairly expensive seed costs. It's fairly long lived and you know normally would just be a pasture uh, you know so if you've got an area that be designated as pasture that's what it could be used for. Tall fescue uh, again another one is it's faster establishing uh, uh, and a pasture. Tall wheatgrass it's the most salt tolerant uh, it's slow to establish uh, it's a conservation grass Really with this one, you're probably not going to do a whole bunch with it besides, you know, get, getting something growing on that land and getting, uh, you know, getting it green and maybe getting some competition against weeds and, you know, just getting the grass growing. And maybe after several years, you might be able to look at uh, planting some alfalfa in amongst it. But, uh, you know, it's kind of for those areas that, uh, on the pre couple previous slides there where we've seen the problem was uh, bad enough that you needed something to uh, just be established on it. Slender wheat glass, it's fast to establish but uh, it's short-lived so again you know um, once you get these areas seeded down you don't want to have to be doing it very often because it is is difficult to get established. So if you're going to use slender wheatgrass, I guess what I would be looking at is probably um, uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, definitely keeping an eye on it and maybe having to go in after a couple of years and maybe just adding some more just so you've got a, got a never-ending cycling going on. There are some other uh, blends and uh, Ducks Unlimited has come out 
quite a, uh, in a few years there, and they have come out with a few blends that they're promoting for for saline areas. Again, uh, you know, it's uh, you'll have to know your area, and then when you go to look at a blend, uh, make sure that the blend has got things that you know are going to work for your area or for your 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 certain situation. There Excuse is a new forage on the scene, Lionel? and uh, it's a brome grass. Yep. Excuse me, Lionel. There's a there's a question here. Um, what about forage seed production in these spots? Okay. Uh, the question was regarding forage seed production in, in these areas, and most of the time, uh, these areas. Uh, aren't fairly large, uh, so that might restrict the ability to grow seed on them. Um, the other thing is, uh, depending on what you're planning on growing for seed, you got to remember it's, uh, it's fairly hard to establish uh, anything on this land to grow. So if you're looking at growing forage seed, uh, first of all, you're going to have one variety growing and uh, so your weed control is definitely going to be an issue. Also, the uh, the other thing is uh, when you're just going to be growing forage seed for, for reproduction, the cost of that seed is going to be a lot more. And uh, you're going to be sowing heavier or higher rates, so your cost per acre for production is going to be higher. And there's a fair bit of risk because you uh, you just may not get anything established. So. Unless you are looking at an area that would be, um, you know, probably the area I would maybe look at would be this area in here, where you know that you're, you're, the chances of establishment are a lot greater. That would be something that I would look at if uh, you know if you had 10 or 20 acres of, of this type of land. That would be something that I would be uh, be looking at. This area in here. Um, Truthfully, in my opinion, is a rescue area, and you know maybe after several years uh, you might be able to to get something going on there. But uh, if uh, if you're looking at something for forage seed, it might be better off looking at this area here that's back from that uh, the severely tolerant areas. So Lionel, uh, I also have uh, another question here in, um, does growth of the, f oh, okay, does growth of the forage for seed vary, hay, oh, something, I'm not sure what he wants here, have any other hay have effect on the salt uptake? Oh, I guess the variety of the forage seed have any effect on the salt uptake. Yeah, well, some forages uh, are, when we go back to the chart here, uh, some forages, uh, they're not, we're not, we're not re uh, eliminating the salt. Like the forages aren't taking the salt up and getting rid of the salt. The forages, what we're wanting to happen here is we're wanting the forages to get established to use the water. And by using the water, they keep the salts down in, out of the, out of the, uh, uh, the soil, the rooting area of the plant, and therefore uh, you get you can get plants established and growing. The problem we have uh, is the water brings the salt up with it, and then as the as the plants use the water, or if the water evaporates from some of the severe areas where there's no plants growing, the water leaves, but the salt stays behind, and that's when we get the big accumulations of salts. Now with rain, that salt will wash down but we need somebody using the water so that salt doesn't come back up again. And uh, that's why we're trying to get some of these plants established in, in the severe areas. So, you know, the ones that are very high uh, salt tolerant, uh, like our slender wheat grasses, um, those would be the ones that you would be looking at for the severe areas. Again, it's, it's very difficult getting these established in some of these areas, and it's definitely not a, you know, I'm just going to go out and plant it and I'm going to solve my problem. This is a, a several year project in some of these very high to high uh, areas. 
where you're looking at the moderate areas, that's where we can probably get some, uh, um, you know, some uh, preempt, preemptive control measures where we can see it's going out into the field uh, or working its way farther out and we, we're noticing it every year. Well, that's where we could look at some of the crops like alfalfa where it can use the water from deeper down and really eliminate the, the, that salt from getting closer to the soil surface. Where the area is right now where you can't grow barley uh, because, uh, because it's uh, white on top, uh, those areas uh, are going to be our, our long-term long -term, uh, control areas where we're going to need you know, several years of trying to get something established on there. Uh, you know, going at a high seeding rate and all this kind of stuff. If we have perfect conditions, you know, you're still, you know, probably looking at a two or three year planting of, of trying to get this thing, you know, to the to the, the state that you wanted it. And, and uh, you know, we look at this picture here and yeah, in the foreground here, there's uh, a lot of alfalfa established, but as you get farther out here, there's still lots of kosher that's growing. There's still a lot of foxtail barley growing in amongst here. So, you know, it still needs uh, still needs work to come back. Now, this is definitely a lot better than it probably was, but, you know, again, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. So, with that... Uh, New brome grass I was talking about, it's called AC Knolls, Knolls brome, and it's a hybrid cross between smooth brome and meadow brome, and it actually has the features of, uh, of both of them. And uh, when you look at it in, in plots here, you can see smooth brome after your first cut, basically that's all you're going to get for the year. Here's meadow brome, which is uh, regrowing after the first cut, and you can see this knolls which is starting to regrow, so not quite as aggressive as metal brome, but, uh, but uh, uh, you know, definitely has, uh, has some characteristics of both of them. And I'm thinking Jane would have put this in the presentation because maybe there's some potential for it on some of these areas, but uh, I would need to check on that myself. Is there any more questions regarding salinity, Lena, before I, I leave? and go on to the cropping issue. Okay, well with that I'm going to uh, go on to cropping issues now from the, from the past week and um, we've been getting quite a few calls again through the office this past week and uh, I kind of put a list of things to look for for this coming week. Uh, one thing is to uh, watch out for our staging of winter wheat. Uh, it's approaching flag leaf stage uh, very fast. And if we're going to be looking at fungicide applications, we should be starting to scout our fields. Um, I was uh, in fields yesterday and the day before yesterday. And uh, a lot of it is in the flag leaf stage already. Uh, the, uh, the head is three quarters of the way up the stem. You can see it right in there. So it's, you know, within another week to 10 days, we're going to be seeing winter wheat heading. And uh, depending on weather conditions, uh, you know, we're going to be needing to be on top of, uh, on top of things to if we are going to do any applications for fusarium or, uh, or leaf disease. The good thing about it is uh, the fields I was in, uh, uh, the leaves looked really clean. Uh, there, uh, the weather conditions we've been having the past couple of weeks have been uh, great for slow disease development. Uh, warm, dry, windy, too windy, but uh, it's definitely made uh, for very slow disease development. And uh, a lot of the winter wheat is looking very clean for disease-wise. Now, we dealt, we've got a fairly good shot of rain last night, and it was fairly general. Uh, again, you know we. We were in a situation where the ground could use uh, could use some rain already, so I don't think it's going to cause a, a lot of issues, but uh, and it's going to dry up fairly fast. So uh, I guess uh, just with the winter uh, winter crops, uh, you know, definitely we need to be uh, keeping an eye on it for the in you know, over the next ten days, anyways, as some of the uh, the ones that. Uh, I guess we're planted early last fall are definitely going to be 
heading out here in June and uh, you know so which is definitely earlier than we are normally looking at spraying so uh, when we're going to be in crop spraying we're probably going to be looking for uh, spraying uh, of disease in our winter crops. The other thing uh, to watch for is flea beetles on early seeded canola. Uh, we've had some reports of some spraying happening in some areas. Some of the canola that was so in, uh, early was sitting in the ground and and just uh, uh, a note that as once the seed is in the ground, the fox starts on your uh, on your uh, your flea beetle control that's uh, applied on the seed, and uh, you know basically we're looking at uh, you know 21 days of control, and in some cases we're uh, we're getting uh, we're getting to that that time period as the canola starts coming through the ground right now. Uh, we're definitely seeing flea beetles out there. Um, once we get some uh, some hot weather again, uh, we'll we'll be seeing uh, be seeing more of them. So just to keep an eye on your canola, uh, there is a good reference chart for uh, damage uh, in some of our past presentations. Uh, John Gawlowski had them on, or if you go onto the MAFRI website, there'll be a, a, an ID area there showing you you know what to look for for defoliation before you need to look at any type of control. But uh, we have had a few producers uh, that have uh, have been doing some some spraying. The other point is uh, some of the early sown cereals uh, that had no burn off. Um, some of them came up a little bit faster than some of the people were expecting, and we're having some major weed problems with some of those ones. Uh, you need to walk these fields and determine what product will be the best option for control. Uh, they're fairly easy to see uh, when you're in the field. You definitely can tell if a burn off was done or not. But even when you're driving down the road, you can see some of these fields showing up. And um, I think uh, the longer we leave them, uh, the more issues we're going to have with uh, with the products we can use. So uh, if you've got uh, got some of these fields, or uh, if you're working with clients with some of these fields, uh, just to make sure that they uh, they're they're on top of them because uh, it can get fairly expensive when we get into some of the uh, later stages of weed control and some of the products and rates we have to go with. So uh, that's just another caution to be looking for for some of those uh, early sown fields. So uh, sprayers in the next uh, week, uh, two weeks here could get really busy. And just a couple slides to end it off here. Um, I was in a field the other day this is one liter of glyphosate on a five to six year old stand of alfalfa sprayed this spring and it just smoked it. And 99% of the time when we make a recommendation, we're saying one liter wouldn't be high enough and uh, you know you need to go higher and you need to go higher. And I think it depends a lot on the growing conditions because there was absolutely nothing coming or regrowing. Uh, there was the odd weed starting to grow and uh, so this producer was actually going to be able to go out and seed this field this year but you can see there's the odd odd alfalfa one that still might make it but you know again uh, the ground was the ground was definitely all the grasses were, were killed and a lot of the alfalfa was killed so you know um, you never know sometimes with uh, with rates uh, so uh, but you know again just to, to show you that uh, one liter um, and you know maybe going to two on some of our easier to kill weeds is not always the answer because maybe that's where some of our resistance issues may be coming from. So with that, uh, I think um, uh, I've com completed the webinar, but I just asked Linda if there's any questions. Okay, well, with that, I'll assume there's no questions. And again, here's uh, the uh, way of contacting myself or Linda. And again, all the other FPAs in the Southwest and South Parkland area. So if you've got questions or if you've got uh, concerns or ideas for upcoming webinars or if you've got uh, problems in any, any of your fields, uh, don't be scared to call any of these, uh, these uh, FPAs.
And I guess with that, that's the uh, that's the end of the webinar. So we will talk to everybody next week.